Olá, bom dia a todos. Meu nome é André Mesquita, eu sou curador aqui do MASP. Antes de mais nada, gostaria de dar as boas-vindas a todos e a todas que estão hoje acompanhando o nosso seminário Histórias Indígenas, é um seminário bastante amplo, de dois dias, aqui no grande auditório do museu. Eu quero fazer um agradecimento especial aos nossos convidados desse seminário, o Biung Ismarrassano, Brooke Andrew, Tayara Tucano, Denilson Baniva, Francesca Cubilo, Heather Arton, Moara Brasil, Nigel Borel, Sandra Benitz, Sarah Liner, Scott Manning Stevens e Tissi Escobar. Histórias Indígenas é parte de um programa curatorial ainda maior, iniciado pelo MASP em 2016, em torno do nosso ciclo de histórias. Para o MASP, a noção de histórias, a gente trabalha com uma noção ampliada de histórias, é, não, a gente inclui nessa noção de histórias não apenas os relatos canônicos da história da arte, da política da cultura, mas, principalmente, nosso interesse, já nos últimos anos, é trabalhar noções não canônicas de história, relatos ficcionais, relatos coletivos e histórias, muitas vezes, eclipsadas pelos vencedores. Em 2016, nós começamos esse ciclo de histórias com as histórias da infância. Em 2017, histórias da sexualidade. Em 2018, tivemos uma ampla amostra é, que vocês já conhecem, histórias afroatlânticas. Este ano, vamos abrir em agosto uma grande exposição coletiva chamada História das Mulheres e Histórias Feministas. Esse ano, também acompanhado de uma série de exposições monográficas e programas públicos em torno dessas histórias. No ano que vem, nós vamos desenvolver um ciclo especial chamado de Histórias da Dança, é, Histórias das Mulheres e Histórias Feministas neste ano. E em 2021, Histórias Indígenas. Os seminários aqui no MASP, eles são realizados com muita antecedência pelo museu, e a ideia dos seminários é apresentar publicamente o tema que nós estamos pesquisando e que vamos trabalhar nos próximos anos, mas, principalmente, os seminários eles servem como uma ferramenta de pesquisa e diálogo com nossa equipe curatorial e de programas públicos, para que seja possível pensar em projetos de exposições e atividades públicas inspirado pelas discussões do seminário. Vale lembrar que o primeiro seminário de histórias indígenas foi realizado aqui no Grande Auditório do MASP em 2017 e contou com as presenças de Ailton Krenak, Aristóteles Barcelos Neto, Cláudio Andujar, Davi Copenaua, Edson Caiapó, Els Lagrou, José Keanomami, Luiz Donizete Grupioni, Luiz Elvira Belaunde, Lucas Vidal, Milton Guran e Pedro Cesarino. Também é importante lembrar que esses seminários, quando nós produzimos, realizamos a exposição em 2021, dedicada a histórias indígenas, nós vamos também publicar uma antologia de textos. É, todos os seminários, depois, eles são acompanhados dessa antologia, e nessa antologia de textos nós publicamos textos e ensaios das apresentações dos palestrantes desse seminário, bem como a tradução de textos que consideramos referência para as discussões acerca deste assunto. Também vale frisar que o MASP tem em sua trajetória um interesse no tema de histórias e culturas indígenas. O MASP organizou diversas exposições com objetos e registros de comunidades indígenas localizadas no território brasileiro. Vale citar, por exemplo, a Exposição de Arte Indígena de 1949, Alguns Índios, de 1983, Arte Carajá, de 84, Índios e Anomami, de 85, e Arte Indígena Caxinawa, de 87. Este seminário ele reintroduz as presenças, discussões e as culturas indígenas neste museu. Eu quero desde já agradecer a equipe curatorial do MASP, especialmente ao nosso diretor artístico Adriano Pedrosa, pela possibilidade, pela possibilidade de realizar este seminário. Agradeço aos meus colegas que ajudaram a organizar este evento, Lilia Schwartz e Tomás Toledo, a equipe de mediação e programas públicos pelo apoio, bem como a todos os colaboradores que estão neste momento trabalhando para o seminário acontecer, e as equipes de tradução simultânea e tradução em libras. Quero também agradecer os produtores desse seminário, Fernando Galo, Natália Tonda e Maicon Ferreira, bem como os curadores que farão a mediação das mesas durante o evento, Fernando Oliva, Amanda Carneiro, Guilherme Gilfrida e Tomás Toledo. Então, gostaria, então, de chamar ao palco o curador do MASP, Fernando Oliva, que fará a mediação da primeira mesa desse seminário. Bem-vindos. Obrigado. Bom dia. 
Essa primeira mesa vai contar com a presença da Dayara Tucano, Richard Anthony e Francesca Cubilo. A gente vai começar, por favor, chamando aqui a mesa Dayara Tucano. A Dayara é artista plástica, mestre em Direitos Humanos pela Universidade de Brasília e coordenadora da Rádio Andê, primeira rádio web indígena do Brasil. Ativista indígena, trabalha com comunicação independente, abordando a defesa dos direitos humanos e dos povos indígenas. Pesquisadora em Educação em Direitos Humanos e Cultura de Paz, com foco sobre o direito à verdade e à memória dos povos indígenas. Pintora e desenhista, seus trabalhos abordam aspectos culturais de seu povo, os Tucano e Epá Mansã, a resistência indígena, as mulheres e o fortalecimento das identidades indígenas. Artesanato. O que significa a sua arte? Você pode me explicar qual é o seu grafismo? Me conta toda a história do seu mundo. Você é índio mesmo? Afinal, é arte? Menor, maior? Arte ancestral? Arte do passado? Porque... à beira dos mares, nas praias, e esqueceram que todas essas praias estão marcadas por nossos espaços, que esses espaços não são simplesmente arqueologia, são livros antigos que contam toda a história dessa terra indígena. Porque... Canibais? Quem devorou a arte indígena? São os antropófagos brasileiros. Movimento muito bonito. Arte é guerra, arte é luta, arte também é terra indígena. Na história da arte, nós podemos ler a história do genocídio de milhões de povos indígenas ao redor do mundo. Eu me perguntava ontem sobre esse convite para estar aqui nesse lugar tão prestigioso, 
a casa, museu, né, de tantas inspirações, tantos cânones, museus que sempre nos devoraram, arrancaram todos os nossos membros e nos colocaram em caixinhas de vidro para nos mostrar até hoje como múmias, sem deixar nossos corpos, nossos antepassados descansar. Capi, Rori, Pati, e admirar a bela arte marajoara. As urnas fúnebres, onde ninguém mais é enterrado, porque hoje índio, quando muito, é enterrado num caixão. E perdemos as contas de quantos foram parar nas covas comuns durante o serviço de proteção ao índio, a ditadura militar e ainda hoje, e perdemos a conta de quantos pajés, de quantos mestres de nossos conhecimentos continuam sendo perseguidos, as casas de rezas guarani incendiadas, as exposições de arte indígenas devastadas, arrastadas, quebradas, violadas, por quem considera que aquilo não é arte. Quando muito hoje uma cerâmica indígena virou artesanato. Capine você pode comprar com alguns índios carentes, no limite da pobreza, para sustentar a sua família, seus filhos, em alguma calçada por, por aí. Em Paraty, São Paulo, Nordeste brasileiro, Amazônia brasileira, Sul do Brasil. Terra indígena. As cuias que representam o ventre da nossa mãe, que nos servem o alimento sagrado, que benzem nossos filhos, a cuia onde nós nascemos, a cuia que contém as águas da vida. Carpinema pia. Era uma vez, um tempo em que o céu ainda não tinha caído. Era uma vez uma floresta repleta de todos os conhecimentos. It was Amazon. Era uma vez os filhos dessas memórias para contar outras histórias. Capinema, pia cauá, capinema, pia cauá, capinema, pia cauá, capinema, pia cauá, deio aia, deio aia, meu marido veio, maricaio aia, yo. Espíritos indecifráveis. O que significa Shapiri? 
Mês passado, eu estava com o Jair Deresbel assistindo dois excelentíssimos professores da USP debatendo a queda do céu, os desenhos de Anomami. O que são esses encantados? Será que alguém consegue ver para além da forma, para além dos discursos dos antropólogos, dos etnógrafos? O que está nas memórias, nos traços, no caminho de nosso povo? Natureza viva. Terra indígena, arte indígena. Ontem, nós comemoramos. Nós comemoramos mais uma vitória de termos reconhecido, através do prêmio de arte contemporânea brasileira, o trabalho do nosso irmão. Denilson Banil. Essa terra, ela fala, ela fala através de toda a nossa expressão. Essas são as obras do coletivo Marcu Runicuim, que sabe que nesse rio, que nessa floresta, ainda tem muitas mensagens para se passar, para se estudar, para se cantar. Capinema Pia
da transformação a transformação dos tempos é a transformação da humanidade o sentido de nossa existência é a transformação e qual é então o sentido da arte
sentir o nosso coração, abrir nosso coração. Ao abraço, a voz, a doçura, a mistério. Preste muita atenção nas nossas mãos também tem tinta. Esse é o Rio Negro. É o meu rio. Eu fiquei pensando muito tempo sobre tantas coisas que a gente poderia estar falando aqui. Eu não faço a menor ideia se a plateia aqui presente já parou alguma vez para escutar artistas indígenas falar, para visitar, conhecer mais de perto a arte indígena brasileira, ou se, de repente, tem alguns universitários muito curiosos em conhecer nossos palestrantes internacionais que vieram de tão longe para poder conversar com a gente. Né? Mas é porque no Brasil é muito comum isso daí. Existe muito mais interesse pela grama mais verde do vizinho do que por aquilo que está acontecendo no Brasil aqui agora. Então, a gente poderia sentar aqui para se lamentar sobre como a arte também tem sido um campo de etnocídio, de articídio, de manipulação, mentira, engano, né? de apropriação, de transformação da nossa imagem, da nossa memória, da nossa verdade, enquanto povos originários e alguma outra coisa artificial que acabou sendo chamado de índio e que as pessoas ainda acreditam que existe por aí muito índio. Um índio do campo das ideias, porque toda vez que cruzam com uma pessoa indígena na frente, vão questionar se é ou não é. E toda vez que cruzam com arte indígena na frente, também vão questionar se é ou não é. Eu me perguntei bastante, o que a gente está fazendo? Em que enrascada, que encruzilhada a gente se meteu? Quantas pessoas não vêm volta e meia nos perguntar o que raios é arte indígena? Será que o que a gente tem que responder mesmo a uma pergunta absurda dessas? Na minha língua, a palavra arte nem sequer existe. Existe hori, existe visão, existe o que é ser, 
existem os aprendizados de cerimônia. Não existe arte de livro de arte, de livro de história da arte, não existe museu, não existe galeria, não existe curador. Então, qual é, me pergunto, me pergunto constantemente, de onde vem essa nossa angústia né, de achar que é necessário traduzir aquilo que nasceu, que está ali, para simplesmente ser do jeito que é. Eu não tenho cara de Wikipédia. Para ficar explicando volta e meia o que, que é, o que, que não é, o grafismo, o significado, o mito, o povo, de onde que veio, se já ouvi falar. Mito me fere. Artesanato me fere. Mercantilizar o sagrado me fere. Me fere profundamente, fere os meus antepassados, fere toda a memória que define quem eu sou como Iepá Maçã. Antes de me reconhecer como indígena, eu pertenço a um povo que tem um pensamento e que tem todo o direito de continuar tendo o seu pensamento. Então, o único recado seria, talvez, não generalizemos, não queiramos criar mais cânones, novos cânones, mais caixinhas. O povo da caixinha são os brancos, quem quer inventar dicionário, botar no papel, isso não faz parte da nossa cultura e a mim, pessoalmente, não me interessa. Eu não faço questão nenhuma, nem de participar de penal, coisa do tipo, a não ser que haja um diálogo, uma troca interessante entre seres humanos, entre memórias, entre vivências. Não me interessa essa ilusão de se achar que arte deva ser privilégio de quem quer que seja, muito menos que identidade possa ser um privilégio também. Apenas somos. Muita gratidão, agradeço pela paciência, né? desculpa a bagunça de tirar as cadeiras do lugar. Né? É, espero ter conseguido compartilhar um sopro mesmo. Obrigada, gente. Eu agradeço a Dayara Tucano pela fala dela, parabéns. Gostaríamos de convidar agora a Rita Ettony, é atual curadora sênior do American Indian Cultural Center and Museum, em Oklahoma, o foco primordial de sua pesquisa e sua produção textual é a análise da intersecção entre o conhecimento cultural indígena e a arte contemporânea. Desde 1993, trabalha com a comunidade de artes nativas. Fez a curadoria de diversas exposições, publicou artigos sobre sua pesquisa e continua em busca de oportunidades para ampliar o discurso acerca das artes indígenas contemporâneas globais. É cidadã da nação Chicxó e tem vínculos familiares fortes com a comunidade Choctaw. Que, ó, por favor, Rita. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on my research today. My name is Heather Ottone, and I am from Oklahoma. I'm honored to be speaking on the traditional lands of the Guarani and other indigenous fam families here, and to this esteemed audience. I am descended from the Choctaw people and a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, a sovereign nation at the center of the universe located in Oklahoma. I want to express my gratitude to our hosts here at the Museo de Art Sao Paulo who have provided excellent hospitality. My research is the product of an ongoing inquiry into the relationships that exist between native artists, their indigenous cultures, and their aesthetic pursuits as materialized in the contemporary art they produce. A closer focus on indigenous art reveals how each work is both the product of and producer of cultural knowledge. 
The produce, pro purpose of this research is to expand current methods of analysis and interpretation of indigenous arts and to facilitate the arts growth and potency as a product of creative individuals and dynamic cultural communities that artists mediate the continued vitality of indigenous cultures through the creation of artworks, and that the artists perform an important role within their communities and larger global societies, despite rapidly shifting social and cultural landscapes. Imagining, that is, to think beyond the physical constraints of proscribed cultural spaces as sites of exchange, that art can be a conduit of culture is based largely on personal experience with the objects and through participation in the indigenous arts community. I ask you to imagine this space because I have lived in that space and I want you to join me there. In 1993, I began serving as the public relations liaison at the Institute of American Indian Arts Museum in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I was asked to prepare promotional information addressing an artist whose art had only been placed within a Euro-American historical context, despite the clear visual relations and references that painter had to distinctive Northwest Coast aesthetic, his images referenced. Despite extensive research, I could not find any analysis that engaged his culture. Where was the writing about native art that addressed the artist, the object, and the culture without privileging a Western cultural paradigm? And while I have considered this question, I have watched the artist continue to create, giving voice to history and ways of being, affirming and validating our indigenous life ways, and creating new ways of imagining ourselves into the future. The artists remain unfazed by the limitations of native scholarship on their work and continue to create in new materials and new forms while remaining grounded within their culture. They are creating the links from the past, sometimes from the beginning of time to the present through their visionary art. My access to the selected community is mediated by my professional position as a curator. My privileged point of access has lent towards the creation of direct personal relationships with the artists. The knowledge explored here is the product of engaging with indigenous artists about their art through innumerable private and public discussions. Listening to their interests has heightened my own desire to resolve these issues. The artists addressed in today's discussions are Marie Watt and Norman, Norman Akers and through their generosity, I've engaged with their art and remain in relationship with each, both as friend and scholar. My scholarship draws from three fields, art history, anthropology, and Native American studies. Each provides an important theoretical and perspective contribution to the analytical framework. From art history, I borrow the foundational approach of focusing on the object as part of an artist's oeuvre and considering how the artist's personal and tribal history inform the work of art. From anthropology, I borrow the perspective that an object is a product of ongoing cultural dynamic that emerges from existing cultural paradigms and duly serves as a producer of new knowledge. And from Native Studies, Native American Studies, I borrow the indigenous methodologies that support my capacity as an indigenous scholar to research within indigenous communities and to draw upon the strength of my ancestors and their wisdom and to employ our cultural protocol to prioritize the tenets of respect, reciprocity, relationship, and responsibility. While art history, anthropology, and Native American studies have informed my knowledge about methods and theories related to the interpretation of contemporary indigenous art, a framework to guide a cultural and object analysis of indigenous art remains absent from any of those fields. A framework that incorporates American Indian cultural paradigms is important because without it, interpretations fail to incorporate the cultural information held within the art the object has used intentionally. I believe that there is value in bringing together methods from these academic disciplines in concert with indigenous methodologies to create an analytical framework that will increase the interpretive value of the art and broaden the discourse around the objects. To be clear, my research interest is the intersection between indigenous American cultural knowledge and the materialization by the culturally grounded artists into contemporary art objects. And drawing upon indigenous knowledge paradigms, I developed a framework that relies on a four lens approach. Materiality considers the physicality of the object and how the object is both a material embodiment of ideas and a generator of culture through its own agency. In order to examine an object's materiality, this lens considers what and how materials are being used. Are there direct or nuanced references to historical uses within the artist's cultural heritage? And how does the artist integrate non-customary materials? 
what ontological references are being made, if any, and what motivations influence the use and selection of materials. By considering these questions, how the materials are intentionally used by the artist and how they perform a role to serve as conduit for cultural knowledge becomes evident. Metaphor and symbolism considers the semiotics of color, design, form, and overall composition. This includes semiotic analysis, considered critical for an oral-based community, as knowledge was often coded into visual references that speak directly to empirical knowledge of science combined with epistemologies. Questions guiding this inquiry include asking what visual devices are employed, what history exists for these designs, what ontological philosophy is conveyed through the metaphoric and symbolic references? What intentions are conveyed through implied meaning? And when multiple visual devices are employed, how do they enact a complex visual dialogue? The consideration for metaphor and symbolism draws upon a history of visual language. Concentricity is a term coined by Dennis Martinez, the Odom Chicano um, tribal traditional knowledge expert, to express the importance of relationships within an indigenous cosmology, addressing familial, tribal, animate, and inanimate, human and non-human, spiritual and metaphysical. Because relationships form cultural roles, ordering social responsibility, political hierarchy, and ceremonial ordinances, these must be explored beyond the human, familial, and intellectual links. Questions that guide this inquiry include what relationships are expressed through the object between the artist and his or her tribal community with other artists, and how is the object informed by ontological relationships with creation story figures and the artist? Finally, temporality recognizes the artist as a creative individual, positioned within a time-space continuum informed by personal experience, family, and tribal history, and works within a network of influence and possible materials. Questions to consider here include what position does the artist enact through the object to history? What position does the artist enact through the object to the future? What influences contribute to the artist's interest in the construction of the object? And what characteristics of the object are positioned through the artist's personal, educational, and physical experiences? What elements within the object relate it to historical cultural practices? And what elements within the object are delimited to a contemporary experience and current events? Through the application of this analytical framework, one can examine the object as a product of an artist's creative vision generated from an indigenous cultural perspective and as an agent enacting the potential for new indigenous cultural production. And while existing methods for art criticism have long been interested in the artist, the art, and its meaning, indigenous American art is often left discommuted from, disconnected from the cultural community. This analytical framework seeks to examine the relationships encoded through the application of ontological philosophical references through the selection of materials, use of metaphor and symbolism, concentristic a priori, and incorporating tribal and personal history, current events, and vision for the future. Norman Akers is currently a faculty member of the School of Art, Department of Visual Art at the University of Kansas. His professional position places him in Lawrence, Kansas, just three and a half hours driving from his home in Pahaska, Oklahoma, located within the Osage Nation in Oklahoma. Relationships between place and identity are common subjects for indigenous artists and have become a mainstay within the paintings and prints of Norman Akers. He has spent his mature career exploring concepts of being Osage through his image making practice as an artist. He's developed a visual vernacular that regularly plays with ideas of place. Osage ontology and history, exploring these through a dis dialogue that uses the tropes of classical Western painting intersecting with Osage epistemology. While pursuing a graduate degree at the University of Illinois, thank you, Akers received questions from his faculty about his imagery's lack of connection to his personal history. Akers had been developing a strong sense of himself as a landscape painter, as a representation of his identity. His professors did not understand his relationship to home was being expressed through the landscape paintings. For Akers, his relationship to landscape was and continues to be a manner of connecting to the place he calls home. This disjuncture was expressed through questions from his professors like, why are you not painting about your culture? This question may have been made more of an expression of an expectation that native culture be expressed in recognizable tropes. 
And during this period of creative pressure, Akers began to develop his unique visual vernacular. The lunchbox was the first symbol that Akers placed within his paintings that seeded the beginning of a visual vocabulary that has grown to include other equally simple, iconic images to represent often dense references to Osage culture and practice. From the initial appropriation of the lunchbox, Akers expanded his use of quotidian objects as symbols to express the dynamic, multivalent experience of being Osage. To this unobtrusive motif, Akers added electrical cords to represent the energy that surges through both physical and metaphysical world by which we are all connected. Tornado siren horns to represent the call for wariness about approaching mythical, spiritual, and literal storms. And spinning tops that symbolize the urgency of time running out and the ongoing cycles to which we are all party and subject. Acorns became a symbol of hope for cultural regeneration. While in college, Akers cultivated his knowledge about his Osage community was by applying his, in his newly gained research skills to learn as much as he could about his tribe. This included extensive readings of the publications by Francis Lafleche, an early indigenous ethnologist who researched and published on the Osage culture. Lafleche's research focused on the Osage in 19th century at a time when the tribe experienced a paradigm shift putting to rest their cultural practices from the pre-reservation period and adopting practices perceived as better suited to the new world of their circumstance of the time, including the adoption of the Enlashka dance. Akers was drawn to a particularly evocative image found in Lafleche's notes of the Ompantanga, or the Great Elk. The Great Elk is an important symbol to the Osage, appearing in the creation narratives in several places. Lafleche recorded the narrative in which the Great Elk appeared and performed mysterious acts by throwing his body upon the water-covered earth, and in so doing, exposed the surface of the soil and replaced anger with peace. In repeatedly throwing himself on the earth to prepare the world for the Honga, the sacred people, he deposited his hairs to seed the multitude of grasses that cover the earth. And upon these acts of creation, the great elk described to the Honga how his body as a manifestation of the earth's surface through the rise and fall of his muscular forms, with his antlers referencing the riverine system of streams and creek. For this discussion, I meant focusing on the Opantaga through the repetition of cycles manifested through the acts of life and death and other symbols and designs that also represent the necessary cycles through which the Earth's natural energy flow and like other life forms continues through a series of generative forms. What is represented by the repeated use of these symbols is a strong sense of futurism. Garrick Bailey noted in his introduction to the Osage and the Invisible World, he says, I recalled one of the basic teachings of the ancient priests, Nothing in the cosmos moves backward. Contrary to popular conceptions about American Indians, the traditional Osage were and the contemporary Osage are continue to be strongly future-oriented. Bailey's observation that the Osage are future-oriented is combined with the Osage capacity to adapt their beliefs to any institution and laid the foundation from which Akers has worked through art to create a future for Osage expressions. Garrick Bailey goes on to describe, rituals were the means by which a people, particularly a non-literate society, preserved and transmitted knowledge. This knowledge was transmitted not just in words, but also through the formal restructuring of the physical behavior of individuals, and that through the use of a variety of material symbols, any formal institution could be made Osage. Upon reflecting and applying this as a principle, it could be argued that the practice resonates with Akers' employment of the lunchbox and other icons as symbols of Osage identity within his art. His adoption and continued use of a material symbol to represent knowledge gained from Osage practice is inherently a historically and culturally valid way of remaining Osage. Okisa II, an oil painting on panel, features a centrally placed elk standing in shallow water at the edge of a rolling plain. The distant horizon bisects the canvas midway with an expansive sky filling the upper half of the canvas and the landscape filling the lower half, which is further divided between exposed land and a river running along the lower and closest ground plain. In contrast to his earlier paintings, the landscape has importantly been placed in balance to the space occupied by the sky. And this balance between earth and sky resonates with concepts of social balance located with the Osage epistemology. Francis Lafleche 
wrote, humans and other living things existed on the surface of the earth, the space between earth and sky, and they further noted that the earth portion of the cosmos was, cosmos was divided between land and water with related life forms. The Osages recognized these spatial divisions along with the temporal divisions present in the universe. The concentristic relationship described represent the extended interdependency and shared space between humans and other life forms. These relationships extend between humans and the environment. And this is further reiterated in Okisa II through the cartographic references included as an interconnected series of blue lines referencing the river system, a motif echoed through the related arcs and curves of the elk's antlers. The map provides a series of interrelated solid black lines, some in sharp angles, and others that likely follow the natural curvature of the landscape. As such, the map lines are an abstraction of the relationship that humans have to the Earth's surface. The map is not just an organizational device, it serves as a guide to the viewer to read the place Acres is referencing. The role of the map, already coded by the field of cartography, is additionally coded with multiple layers of meaning that required an understanding of Osage epistemology and history to discover. Across the horizontal middle of the canvas, a bold red line transects the painting as an element of the map, visually suspended between the landscape and the elk and connecting the earth with the sky. Its placement implies a highway running along the lower portion of the Osage Reservation. Okay, Acres confirmed that this was a heart line in a sense, but it's also the highway we travel on too. And through this double entendre, the red line becomes a conduit for the flow of Osage identity through the canvas in relationship to this place. On the upper left corner of the image plane, an abstracted sun descends from above as a yellow ovoid, though it has not completely transitioned into the picture plane, perhaps connecting what is seen with what is invisible. Partially obstructing the sun are three floating acorns. In addition to serving as a symbol of hope, the acorns perform an important role collectively as a visual device, largely as a product of the variation in their scale. The largest one is so significantly larger to the farthest and smallest one, though all three are viewed in front of the sun, thus implying a very deep spatial order. The largest acorn implies a closeness to the viewer who recognizes that it must be quite close to the front of the forward plane, visually pushing the elk away from the viewer through the mechanisms of perspective, further placing the elk in the middle ground, or reiterating okisa in Osage, which means halfway there. One cannot ignore that the map and the forward ground plane intersect at the site where the elk's legs break the river's surface. The placement of the elk in the water, where his antlers then bridge into the sky, draws a distinct visual relationship between the sky and the earthbound water. The map's network of roads and intersections become a visual reference to the network that also exists within the tribe's co complex system of relationships, such as the clan and moiety system, that continue to organize members and families. The use of place names anchors this cultural paradigm to a geographic space, reiterating the, re reiterating the relationship that the Osage have to the cartographic description. The sites of the Anlashka dance are materialized both on the map and by the elk's body. Gray Horse is located just below the elk's hindquarters, perhaps a relationship between, between the elk's generative physical parts and to Acre's spiritual place. Pahuska is located just to the left of the elk's heart and is, interestingly, the only named site located along the heart line that Acres activated with the strong red line. And Hominy is placed where the elk's left leg enters the water, the ripples serving as a reiterative circle, emphasizing the importance of this place. These connections that are visualized by Acres in his painting also express this idea that remembering those relationships are a critical part of his identity and of being Osage. In the lower right of the image, within the area identified as a river, a small island emerges with a budding acorn tree located just on the left edge of the island. The small island placed within the river and its corresponding budding oak trees serves as an additional bridge intersecting earth and sky. The tree is budding despite the destruction that exists in the trees that have been visibly cut down in the valley just above and behind. This budding oak speaks to the hope represented by the acorns that float around like the seeds of germination from which the Osage people originated, descended, descending from the sky in search of a new home. It buds while located on an island, isolated and yet inhabiting the same space as the elk. This emergent growth might also be seen as a metaphor for Acre's own spiritual recovery and reinvigoration of his participation within Osage cultural practices after living away from his community. 
Just to the upper left of the island, a series of bubbles rest atop the watery surface. Akers described that he uses bubbles, circles, and ovals as visual devices to draw attention to important places within his image. He aligned the circular form of the bubble to its transitional thing. He explained that the bubbles were delicate worlds, all unto themselves, subject to immediate extinction upon being popped. I do think of it as a doorway that has the potential to be an alternate space. It exists in a different space and time. The alternate space that Akers references can be alternatively read as a metaphor for how indigenous communities live within larger worlds, both as hegemonic philosophies independent of the larger social structures and delicately subject to the ecological disruptions that occur beyond their control. The delicate branches of the tree bud can also be seen as mimicking the fluid lines of the elk's antlers. The relationship between the elk's metaphorical symbolism and the oak tree bud are links between earth and sky, and read together they form the strongest suggestions that Akers has painted a broader conceptual image. The placement of the elk's open, bellowing mouth just at the direct center of the image may also serve as an invocation of place where the energy of life must flow, acted at the very center of Okisa too. The manifestation of the landscape, the cartographic guides to its specific location in combination with the symbolic elements of the elk, the acorns, and the layers of the painting surface, lend to considering Acre's painting as a vortex for Osage identity and as a metaphor for Osage ontology. Acre's invocation of the primordial time of creation materialized through the elk activates a culture that to some degree draws upon a historical construction of Osageness. Akers has repeatedly used the icons of the elk, an oak tree, and its acorns, the cedar tree, maps, rivers, roads, and rotating space. He plays with doorways, sirens, and the linear function of power chords to express the relationship that Osage have to the past, the present, and the future. This is a profound act of artistic agency from a cultural perspective. Akers activates the Osage past by visually mapping his relationships to the places of earth and sky, while generating the potential for, potential for an Osage future through the image itself. Marie Watt's blanket stories, three sisters, four pelts, sky women, cousin Rose, and all my relationships. Marie Watt is a professional artist who lives with her husband and two daughters in Portland, Oregon. She and her sister grew up in the suburbs of Seattle, Washington, the daughters of a Seneca mother from the Cattaraugus Reservation in New York and German Scott father, raised in the ranching community of Wyoming. Though raised quite a distance from her Seneca tribal community, her mother's teaching position in the local school district's Indian education program provided access to a vibrant intertribal community. Watt described her access to the native community. So while we did see family on the East Coast, I will say that I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and Seattle area and in the suburbs native and urban Indian community and visiting family occasionally. Rather than having a tribally specific community like Acres, Watt's tribal community was formed through an intertribal urban community. This is a common experience as 70% of Native Americans live in urban spaces. Romaine Watt, Marie's mother, played an important role in the formation of Marie's early identity as a Native person. Foundationally, her mother was the direct link to her matriarchal Seneca community. That mother-daughter relationship is particularly key for the Seneca people, for whom tribal membership can only be established through a Seneca mother. As a woman descending from a Seneca mother, and later as the mother of two daughters of her own, Marie Watt fulfills the role created by Sky Woman during the creation of Turtle Island for the Seneca people, perpetuating the pivotal and critical roles of mothers who contribute to a continuum of Seneca presence. Though she's never lived in residence on the Cattaraugus Reservation, Watt remains connected to her tribal community in numerous forms, and her cultural identity is important to her in all her roles as daughter, mother, wife, and artist. And family remains a critical part of her connection to the Seneca community. She recounts the importance of creating national and culturally centric network of arts professionals to her growth into the role as artist. To the importance of these relationships, Watt commented, it has been a series of encounters and relationships that have brought me to the place I am today as an artist. In 1994, Watt elected to pursue graduate studies in painting and printmaking at Yale University School of Art. Being in a program where her experience as a graduate student in a rigorous academic program was shared with her peers put her experience into perspective. She described the challenges she faced as a female student at Yale in an art department without any tenured women professors and a disinterest in exploring materials. 
While Co Watt cultivated a strong interest in Jasper Johns, particularly for his Target series, his rejection of an applied meaning to the image as a symbol and his use of hatch marks as a repeated gestural um, mark, especially as a printmaker. She began exploring the relationship between Jasper Johns and Edvard Munch, who also used the repeated hatch marks as a reference to a blanket that he kept on his bed, a subject often depicted in his paintings. And while appreciating the simplicity of the target's form and palette, Watt began to explore this target as a symbol of matriarchal and intergenerational relationships. Constructing targets out of blankets merged her interest in materiality and symbolism with her personal identity, a material interest inspired by the Bauhaus artists. In 2003, as the relationship to the target and the hatch marks began to align with Seneca worldviews, Watt began conceiving of the folded blanket as the potential enunciation of the sequence of hatch mark lines, or perhaps the hatch marks as folded blankets. Watt's plastic conversation with contemporary art extends beyond her references to Johns and Monk, particularly as the hatch marks transition from being repeated at an angle to being horizontal and stacked vertically. Watt repeats the lines as hatch marks layered horizontally, but as they start to move upward, one can also see them as exposed segment layers of the target. Moreover, a folded blanket is so commonly folded in layers that her emphasis on at least a sequence of three hatch marks seems to support the possibility for this conceptual relationship. It becomes clear in looking closely at her early textile works that Watt felt a freedom to explore the relationship between mark making and physical space, creating a work that to some degree initiated out of a cultural impetus. Watt is quoted by Rebecca Dobkins to say, we are received in blankets, we leave in blankets. The work is inspired by the stories of those beginnings and endings and the life in between. I am interested in human stories and rituals implicit in everyday objects. I find myself attracted to the blanket's two and three dimensional qualities. On a wall, a blanket functions as a tapestry, but on a body it functions as a robe and living art object. Blankets also serve as a utilitarian function, and as I fold and stack blankets, they begin to form columns that have references to linen closets, architectural braces, memorials, sculpture, the great totem poles of the Northwest, and the conifer trees around which I grew up. In Native American communities, blankets are given away to honor people for being witness to important life events, births and coming of age, graduation, marriage, namings, and honorings. And for this reason, it is considered as great a privilege to give a blanket as it is to receive one. The blankets, everyday objects, are wielded as powerfully multivalent symbols in Watt's sculptural and painterly works. They participate in a century of Duchampian appropriation of things that we know, like Johns, who used the target and flags for the same purpose. Watt's use of the blankets, even the stacking of blankets, feels at once familiar and out of place. In addition to the dialogue that Watt intentionally engaged with contemporary art history, she simultaneously employs a Seneca worldview, endowing the blankets with a meaning that is less evident to the untrained eye. Understanding this nuanced intention was reveal revealed itself while Marie Watt and I described, um, discussed the Blanket Story series over dinner in 2011. Watt in ex explained in a casual conversation that for her, the blanket stacks were imagined as homage to the earliest of the Seneca creation stories. She imagined each stack of blankets as a way to prepare a space for the progenitor of the Seneca people, Sky Woman, who was wife to the Ancient One, the masculine de deity who ruled the sky world and lived in the great celestial lodge beneath the celestial tree. The Seneca story of Sky Woman describes that she fell through a hole in the sky and was protected and cared for by the animals as they together formed Turtle Island and began the human race. In Seneca philosophy, every Seneca woman is a direct descendant of Sky Woman, and it is from this lineage that the corpus of Seneca people emerge, former, present, and future. Understanding this story, then, one can see that the blanket stack serves as a soft landing spot for Sky Woman, for whom the Seneca people are in an ongoing and perpetual state awaiting her imminent arrival. Further, through the placement of the Blanket Stories series in a repeated installations across North America, one might also conceive of Watt as subversively claiming these varied gallery spaces temporarily as Seneca space, at least for the duration of the installations. As a sculpture, the claiming of space is more actual rather than implied. Viewers are, by museum protocol, expected to allow a safe distance between the sculpture and, by extension, the base or riser upon which it is displayed. So the space the stack is, is granted in the gallery would be at least the space of the cedar planks, but more likely an area greater, recognizing the flow of traffic surrounding the actual claim space. 
As a vertical tower of blankets, Watt's blanket story series has been discussed by Janet Berlow and Rebe Rebecca Dobkins, each making reference to the sculpture as being in conversation with art history's canon of obelisks and monuments, an astute and relevant comparison. In her essay for the 2005 Idle Jorg Native American Art Fellowship exhibition, Into the Fray, Berlow focuses on the materials and the history of blankets. In column, the, first reference, the artist references blankets stacked for distribution by white traders as well as native chiefs. The vertical tower of folded blankets also evokes totem poles, that quintessential Indian icon, and endless column by the Romanian modernist Constantine Brancusi. But it all starts with a modest, worn, domestic item, the blanket. As early as 1611 in New France, Eastern Canada, Jesuits described Indians wearing wool trade blankets, some of them fashioned into capotes, loosely tailored overcoats. And throughout the next three centuries, blankets were central to economic exchange with native people, traded first for the highly prized beaver pelts so sought after in Europe for the manufacture of felted hats. Blankets were later exchanged for many different skins and hides. French and English mills supplied the wool blankets. In addition to these histories of creativity, adaptation, and generosity, the trade blanket also brings to mind a more nightmarish history, the smallpox blanket, the deliberate infection of native peoples with smallpox through the distribution of blankets taken from epidemic victims is a truism of American oral history. And through these collective references in Watt's hands, the blanket becomes a marker of native history, a feminist response to art history, and a subversive marker of Seneca space. When asked about connecting the blankets to the story of Sky Women in the stacked form, Watt provided clarity on her own experience with the work. I think the cultural references are mindful intentional and intentional. For me, using the blankets was first and foremost acknowledging my culture. Also, I thought that it could potentially be a way of using a material that has resonance in other indigenous communities. Having grown up in the Pacific Northwest and attending potlatches before, I knew that blankets had this significance in the Pacific Northwest in particular, and that was my starting point. What was unanticipated for me, she describes, was that as a person who had very little experience in making sculpture, was how the materials were so loaded for other communities. For me, I wanted to find a type of material that had resonance in a lot of other communities. I think it also spoke to my sense of community, which is broad and dynamic. The topic of my exploration, Blanket Stories, to which Wa often abbreviates the title to Three Sisters, was exhibited at the National Museum of the American Indian and then three subsequent sites before it was purchased by the Seattle Art Museum. Each installation required that the blanket arrangement was tailored to the available space and ceiling height, and once again, the sited space for the work's installation prohibited any previous arrangement. In its final form, Watt worked with the museum to combine all the blankets into a single tower, exploring the full height of their gallery. And with this placement, the sculpture is a proto-feminist Seneca voice in dialogue with history of obelisks and totem poles, which are historically male-gendered forms, within a gallery of regional indigenous art. Watt describes, I'm really interested in how this columnar form connects sky and earth, and I think for me it intentionally subverts the horizon line, which is this Western approach to place oneself in the world. Watt's reference to the importance of the columnar form as a connection to the earth and sky refers to the concept of the axis mundi. Within indigenous cultures, the importance of the axis mundi can be seen in the location of a drum in a powwow circle or the fire in a stomp dance circle. Within so many native cultures, we had noticed a shared regard for marking the place by creating an axis mundi that becomes, for the duration of that ceremony, the center of the world as a temporary mechanism drawing things into cosmological order. Through the use of space for whatever the purpose, the axis mundi immediately creates a center around which the participants share a common understanding of how order should be guided. And through this consideration, her blanket stories series in each of its installation potentially serves as an axis mundi around which things can fall into order. Marie Watt's blanket stories is a towering stack of folded blankets that defies the simplicity of its primary material, the reclaimed wool blankets. Three Sisters becomes a lightning rod for people to share their stories and make connections with the community. As curator Ben Mitchell wrote in his monograph, in our stories, the urges and impulses of history, tradition, image, narrative magic, and surprise are all woven together. This is Marie Watt's essential subject and her compelling vision, the transformation of the ordinary into the extraordinary. Watt's creative vision is akin to an alchemist, both transforming the ordinary into that which is most desired. 
And through the use of the blanket, Watt's sculpture embodiment creates a physical mechanism that holds the potential of pri providing order where it may not have abided before. It has been my intention that in sharing this analysis of two selected objects, each created by an artist from a different cultural background, different gender, different materials, that I might provide a compelling examination of the role of materiality, the use of metaphor and symbolism, concentricity and temporality. Thank you for your attention and your patience. Muito obrigado a Heather Alton pela sua fala, parabéns. Importante lembrar, por favor, as perguntas. Vamos se animar um pouco mais nas perguntas aí, pessoal. Está vindo muito pouca pergunta. Elas estão passando com esses papeizinhos, vocês podem escrever e devolver para elas, tá bom? Obrigado. A gente vai ter agora a fala da Francesca Cubilo. Francesca Cubilo é curadora sênior de arte aborígene e das ilhas do Estreito de Torres, na National Gallery of Australia com 30 anos de experiência em museus e em galerias. Trabalhou em diversas instituições estatais e nacionais da Austrália, incluindo o South Australia Museum, National Museum of Australia e Museum Art Gallery of the Northern Territory, e mais recentemente a National Gallery of Australia. É bolsista do Winchell Churchill Memorial Trust, bacharel em artes com menção honrosa em antropologia e doutoranda na Australian National University. Cubilo tem diversos textos publicados, participou de conferências, de discussão e aberturas de fóruns nacionais e internacionais acerca de temas como a repatriação de relíquias ancestrais e dos, dos indígenas australianos, arte e cultura aborígene e das ilhas do Estreito de Torres, bem como museologia e curadoria indígena australiana. Natural de Darwin, ela é uma mulher inaua, Larraquia, Bardi e Wardman, da região do Top End australiano, e presidente da Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair Foundation desde 2010. Por favor, Francesca. Obrigado. Good morning, everyone. As a Yanua, Bardi, Waterman, and Larakia Aboriginal woman from Australia, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional people of Sao Paulo paying particular respects to their ancestors, the land, and the cur current custodians. I take this opportunity to thank them for the chance to speak on their land today. I also want to acknowledge my fellow speakers, the indigenous people who work tirelessly to ensure our histories are shared are known, are protected around the world. To those who have spoken before me, I thank you for the words that you shared and for those who will speak over the coming days. I look forward with anticipation to hear the remarkable stories of your families, your peoples, your ancestors and your country. Of course, to Adriana Pradeso, and the wonderful team here at the Museum of Art of Sao Paulo. I thank you for taking care of me, making sure I arrive safely, and giving me the chance to share with you some of my thoughts in regards to the Aboriginal people and how they have been represented in the visual record from 1770 to 1901. The year 2020, marks the 200th anniversary of Captain James Cook's voyage and landing in Australia. He was both explorer, navigator, and cartographer in the British Royal Navy. Since his arrival in 1770, each decade up until, up until today has given rise to definitive works of art by Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians that have shaped our understandings of Aboriginal art, Aboriginal artists, and the people and culture from which the art originates. This initial paper is one of three papers that will attempt to chart this history via an examination of the visual and pictorial literature that has emerged across this 250 year period. Various works will be looked at in detail, artists' backgrounds unpacked and societal intentions explored. Currently in Australia, 
There is a lot of presumptions about Aboriginal people, their art and culture. These notions of cultural norms have been conveyed through various media. Western cultural heritage institutions such as museums and art galleries have had a long history of representation of Aboriginal people and culture. One obvious anomaly associated with these stories of representation is that in the majority of instances, they, these have been narratives written by and for the colonizer. When we consider historical collections of visual imagery and material culture, we must consider we must acknowledge that a large percentage of these collections have been acquired by non-Indigenous people for non-Indigenous audiences. When I studied Australian art in 1980 as part of my final year at secondary college, chapter one of the main reference book by Bernard Smith's Australian Paintings, 1788 to 1980, was titled The First Artists. 1788 to 1824. I was again reminded that Australia's history was written and taught from a Eurocentric perspective of the colonizer. In spite of this, I saw in Smith's books for the first time, Aboriginal people represented in paintings and illustrations from the late 1700s and early 1800s by artists such as the Port Jackson painter, Richard Brown, Joseph Lysett, Augustus Earle, Benjamin Deutero, Robert Dowling, and John Glover. Regrettably, these representations, often placed in the context of the Australian landscape, served only illustrative purposes as ethnographic props. At the time, I looked at these landscape paintings with mixed emotions. It was strange to see people like myself brown skin and sovereign owners of the land, depicted in a non-complementary manner or as part of the flora and fauna of the region. These silhouetted images appeared on the margins or in the distance, most often small in scale and lacking detail, positioned in ways that revealed their subjugation and disempowerment. They rarely look directly at the viewer or are placed centrally within the image. History is about people, either as observers, participants, recorders, and interpreters of both events and moments in time. The presumption is that once it is written by an authoritative vo voice, then it must be true and an accurate representation of events. Hindsight and further research has taught us that this is often not the case. In fact, we are all too familiar with the fact that history is written by the victors and therefore the narrative is both biased and skewed in favor of the dominant regime. Therefore, the presiding society continues to dictate and determine how history is recorded and interpreted. The 19th century French historian Ernest Renan tells that violence and forgetting is an integral aspect of nation building. He states, forgetting, I would even say historical error, is an essential factor in the creation of a nation, and it is for this reason that progress of historical stories often poses a threat to nationality, to nationality. Historical inquiry, in effect, throws light on the violent acts that have been taken place at the origin of every political formation, even those that have had more, been most benevolent in their consequences. Unity is always brutally achieved. This was very much the case with the colonial endeavors within Australia. Professor Joseph Pugliese, an academic at Macquarie University in Sydney stated recently, from the moment that the Australian con continent was invaded and colonized by the British in 1788, it witnessed both random and systematic campaigns of attempted indigenous genocide. The collective acts of resistance deployed by Australia's indigenous people 
in order to defend their unceded land and to safeguard their lives provoked settler campaigns of massacre in order to secure possession of the continent and its islands. This genocidal violence sits at the very heart of the history of the Australian nation state. Yet when cast in the context of Renan's astute observations, the violence of this history is precisely what had to be forgotten by non-Indigenous Australians in order to preserve the myth of the Australian nation as a state that has never experienced war on its own terrain. In 1968, an Australian anthropologist by the name of W.E.H. Stanner was invited to present a major lecture known as the Boyer Lectures. As part of his presentation, Stanner spoke about the way in which Australian history operated on a basis of a cult of forgetfulness practiced on a national scale, which he later called the Great Australian Silence. According to Stanner, British settlement spread over the content, continent on the basis of mania for land. A basic pattern was repeated. Initial contact, conflict, violence, the inevitable triumph of the stronger group, dispossession, disease, demoralization, death. In addition, not only was there a national process of forgetting, but for Stanna, there was also a growing societal sense of contempt and indifference towards the Aboriginal populations. He often used the term slightlessness, a tendency for Australians to deny any sense of responsibility through the process of averting their gaze. An example of the extent of this attitude is highlighted by Reverend G.A. Wood, who stated that the cause of the extinction of the Aborigine lies in the savage himself and ought not, ought not to be attributed to the white man. Therefore, with this in mind, it is important to revisit the imagery from this early period and interrogate these depictions, questioning the intentions of both artists and the broader society for which the artists were creating the work. What were the underlying messages that were being conveyed through these depictions? In addition, we must look beyond these depictions of anonymous and named Aboriginal figures and draw upon the historical record, which is currently being rewritten in Australia today to understand what actually took place historically. We must look to the faces and bodies that appear before us and consider their plight. Aboriginal oral history and contemporary Aboriginal artistic responses to this imagery sit alongside these narratives and we must consider the multiple voices, stories, histories within this complex chorus. Each slide, that, each slide that I will present today has multiple artworks from a particular decade. However, due to the time restraints, I will focus on one image per slide. You will note the decade that I will speak to as it is highlighted in the top left-hand corner. Truth-telling and interrogating the colonial narrative. Two of the natives of New Holland advancing in combat is the earliest illustration from the period 1770 and is based on sketches by Sidney Parkinson, who was a draftsman and natural history artist employed by Sir Joseph Banks on the Endeavour voyage through the Pacific during 1768 to 1771. Cook describes in his journal that the two men threw a rock in their direction and in response he initially fired one shot. 
The two Aboriginal men then threw several spears in return. Several shots were then fired once more as a warning and that one of the men then appeared to be wounded. The official record, uh, the official account records Cook being attacked by the natives. Parkinson's sketches were converted into lithographs as part of the printing of a journal of a voyage to the South Seas in His Majesty's ship, the Endeavour, 1773. The Aboriginal people from this region are known as the Gweagal Nation. A man of Van Diemen's land, a woman of Van Diemen's land. On Cook's third and final voyage, 1776 to 1780, he arrived at Adventure Bay on Bruny Island in Tasmania for supplies. And it was during this stopover that John Weber made studies of Aborigines, birds, and possums. These engraved images were based on Weber's initial drawings and were published it later with his assistance in Cook, James, and King's voyage to the Pacific Ocean undertaken by the command of His Majesty for making discoveries in the Northern Hemisphere. Both images of Aboriginal people at this time appear to be referencing athleticism, grace, and nobility. Jean-Jacques Rousseau's sentiments regarding the noble savage were part of the Enlightenment discourse that was circulating in Britain at the time. And no doubt, Cook's general reference to Australia's Aboriginal people being far more happier than we Europeans because of their close proximity to a simpler way of life carried some degree of weight in Britain. And hence, these images were generated, duplicated, and distributed widely. Wild, widely. Hearth length portrait of Ganagana, 1790. Australian Aboriginal. This Aboriginal man is from the New South Wales area near the British colony of Port Jackson, a harbour in southeastern Australia where Sydney was founded in 1788. The artist is referencing, the artist is referenced as the Port Jackson painter. This artist was active during the period 1788 to 1797. You'll note in both of these illustrations that they reference Aboriginal men of the Port Jackson district. The people from this region are the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation. It is intriguing to note that we know more about the unknown Port Jackson artists than we do about these Aboriginal men. Further research is required to understand who these named and unnamed men were and what their purpose of these, what were the purposes of these depictions? 1800. Nouvelle Hollande, Cororarigal, France, 1807. Nouvelle Hollande, Quiriquin, France, 1807. Are engravings that reference the original watercolor paintings by Nicolas Martin Petit who was part of the Bodan expedition from 1800 to 1804 to Australia and Tasmania. According to Australian curator and historian, Philip Jones, the French demonstrated a preparedness to engage with Aboriginal society on its own terms regarding Aboriginal people unequivocally as members of the same human family. That level of engagement stands in stark contrast to the British investigations proceeding almost simultaneously under Flinders. Richard Brown's depictions of Aboriginal people are often elong elongated angular silhouettes that can be best described as caricatures aimed at amusing rather than informing. It is thought that many of his works were intended as souvenirs and conformed to an English colonist perspective rather than providing a realistic record. It is difficult to determine what Brown's intentions were, however. 
He painted many of the images from life and it has been argued in recent years that his works were created as and are useful as ethnographic record. Bungaree. Bungaree was an Aboriginal Australian from the Kurungai people of the Broken Bay area. He was known as an explorer, entertainer, and Aboriginal community leader. He is significant in that he was the first person to be recorded in print as an Australian. You can see him represented here and here. Bungaree first came to prominence in 1798 when he accompanied Matthew Flinders on a coastal survey as an interpreter, guide and negotiator with local Indigenous groups. He later accompanied Flinders on his circumnavigation of Australia between 1801 and 1803. Flinders was the cartographer of the first complete map of Australia, filling in the gaps from previous cartographic expeditions and was the most prominent advocate for naming the continent Australia. Flinders noted that Bungaree was a worthy and brave fellow who on multiple occasions saved the expedition. Bungaree continued his association with exploratory voyages when he was accompanied Philip Parker King to Northwest Australia in 1817. In 1815, Governor Lachlan Macquarie dubbed Bungaree the chief of the Broken Bay tribe and presented him with 15 acres of land on George's head on George's head. He also received a breastplate inscribed Bungaree, Chief of the Broken Bay Tribe, 1815. There are multiple statues of Matthew Flinders in Australia extolling his navigational skills as the first person who circumnavigated Australia. There is even a statue of Flinders' cat, Trim, including many stories and books about the cat's adventures but there is very little mention of Bungaree. And there is definitely no statues dedicated to this remarkable man who was the first Australian born of the Australian continent to circumnavigate Australia. Like Thomas Bock and Joseph Lysett, Charles Rodeus was a convict artist who had talent and arrived on the boat as a prisoner in 1829. He famously, post-release from prison, produced two series of Aboriginal portraits, portraits in 1831 and 1840. His sensitive crayon and wash illustrations were quickly converted to lithographs for sale and distribution to a broader audience. It was felt that his representations of Aboriginal people were both accurate and respectful for their time. The decade 1840. The portrait Mathena by Thomas Bock was completed around 1842. Thomas Bock completed several watercolour portraits of Tasmanian Aboriginal people, many of whom were associated with George Augustus Robinson's so-called friendly mission. Commissioned by Robinson himself, these sensitive rendered images were so admired for their accuracy that Bock was asked to make several duplicate copies by patrons Lady Jane Franklin and Reverend Henry Dowling. In 1842, Lady Franklin commissioned him to copy a portrait of Mathena, the Aboriginal girl who was adopted during the period she lived in Van Diemen's land, she, which she intended in 1842, Lady Franklin commissioned him to copy a portrait of Mathena, the Aboriginal girl she adopted during the period she lived in Van Diemen's Land, which she intended to send to London to be lithographed in order to show the English a degree of civilization as compared with Brock's prints of wild natives. However, no prints of the seven-year-old Mathena in her favorite red dress are known to have eventuated. 
One of Bok's watercolours of Mathena is in the Tasma Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery. The other is represented in a private collection in the UK. What this portrait does not tell is a story of a small child, the age of five years old, taken from her family to live with Lady Franklin and Governor Franklin for a three year period, and then was abandoned because they returned to the UK. She was placed back into an orphanage on country she didn't belong to, stayed there for a brief period, then returned back to her family who had then been re removed to Flinders Island. She spent a very difficult time there for 12 months and then died in Hobart under circumstances that nobody should be exposed to. 1850, portraits of Nanaltara, a young Penindi, and also portrait of Samuel Conwillam. Nanalta was born into a culture suffering inexplorable pressure from land-hungry colonists. By 1838, Governor Gawler was voicing what many colonists believed was the only hope for survival left to the indigenous people was to make them happy, he proclaimed. But you cannot be happy unless you imitate good white men. You need to build huts, wear clothes, work hard and be useful, and above all, love God. Archdeacon Matthew Hale sought to create the conditions for this happiness by establishing the Aboriginal Mission Institution of Punindi, which is near Port Lincoln, in 1850. Cricket was introduced at the mission as a healthy recreation and useful part of the civilising process. The Punindi cricketers were considered to be the best in the district. On occasion, they played in Adelaide, and it is most likely on one of these visits in 1854 that Nanalta sat for his portrait. Crosslands accepted an uncharacteristically small fee for this work, and its companion portrait of Samuel Conwillen, a lay preacher at Penindi. His Crosslands Penindi portraits are amongst the earliest depictions of Indigenous Australians appearing fully Europeanised and assimilated, and were commissioned by Hale in an attempt to show that colonisation had benefited the Indigenous population. 1860. Group of Natives of Tasmania, England, 1860, by Robert Dowling. This is this image. Critic Bernard William Smith assessed the work as a history painting in the full sense of the word, with the natives seated in of their situation, around the dying embers of a burnt out log near a great blackened stump. And in the far left corner, there is a leafless tree with shattered branches. This work was painted in England some 30 years after the Black Wars in Tasmania. The Black Wars was a period in which some 90% of the Tasmanian Aboriginal population was murdered and massacred, poisoned and moved off their country. And therefore, this painting is done 30 years later, as if a memorial to and a depiction of a people on the verge of extinction. The work that I'll be speaking to is by Fred Kruger, Queen Mary. Queen Mary, Ballarat Tribe, from a bound album entitled Souvenir Album of Victorian Aboriginals, Kings, Queens, etc. The sepia tone photograph of an Aboriginal woman dubbed Queen Mary Ballarat was taken in the 1870s by German photographer Frederick Kruger. Kruger had been commissioned by the Victorian Board for the Protection of Aborigines to capture two series of photographs at Corrindirk Aboriginal Station. 
The first collection of photographs focused on the station's success and the pastoral civilization of its residents. Kruger's second commission, however, more advertly reflected the turbulent political climate in which it emerged. In the midst of these political tensions, Kruger was also working on images which would appeal to a broader commercial audience. Queen Mary appeared on the first page of the souvenir album which you could buy of Victorian Aboriginals, a palm sized souvenir compilation of notable Indigenous figures assigned European royal titles. 1880, Corroborees by William Rab William Barrick. We begin to see the first representations of Aboriginal culture. We begin to see the first representations of Aboriginal culture by Aboriginal artists. William Barrick's corroboree is one of the largest and most impressive of the drawings he produced as a way of passing on his knowledge of Aboriginal culture. In the top half of the composition, men holding boomerangs and clapsticks are dancing in ceremony. Their bodies are painted with clan designs and they wear long pubic covers. Barrick has depicted the forms of the dancers in a repetitive, repetitive freeze-like arrangement with their arms raised, in pri in, raised and legs spread. In the lower part of the composition, seated participants wear elaborately decorated possum skin cloaks, while the man standing at their center beats time with two boomerangs. During his lifetime, Barrick experienced enormous cultural change. He was a child when Europeans began to make pastoral incursions into the Port Phillip district of, Vo of Victoria in the mid-1830s. And in 1863, he was one of the first people to resettle at the self-sufficient Aboriginal station at Corrindoke outside of Melbourne. He had her 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 hereditary status as clan elder of his people, the Wiradjuri, and one was one of the leaders of the Corrindoke community. I have two more slides, but I might just quickly refer to them and then conclude. 1890, we see the work of another prominent Aboriginal artist of this period, Tommy McRae. His depictions of William Buckley, a white convict who got lost in the Victorian region for a 30-year period, is depicted here with the Aboriginal community. You can see another one of his sketches here and a depiction here of the tall ships. And in 1990, 1900, a nine, the, in 1882, Canadian theatrical agent Robert A. Cunningham came to Queensland to secure wild Aboriginal people as performers for touring in America and Europe in the Barnum Show Ethnological Congress of Strange and Savage Tribes. Six of the nine troop members recruited were from separate communities on Palm Island and three from Hinchbrook Island. They did not all speak the same traditional languages. Only two spoke some English and these were used to assert Cunningham's claims that were, they were not coerced. Their performance in Barnum's Congress began in 1883 and in the following year, two members of the troop, Tambo and Wangon, had died. Cunningham left Barnum in 1884 and began a long tour across Europe despite the deaths of Bob, Toby Sr., Sussie and Jimmy in 1885. Only Jenny, her son Toby and Billy returned to Australia in 1888. Cunningham was undeterred by the death of the majority of his first troop and returned to recruit a second group in 1892 in preparation for the living ethnological displays planned for the 1893 World Columbian Exposition in Chicago. It is difficult for Aboriginal people to look at paintings, illustrations and photographs from this period because they portray a time when our culture was invaded, our country was invaded and our people treated without respect, marginalized, murdered, segregated, and enslaved. Substantial populations tragically declined due to deaths from the systematic poisoning, murders, and massacres that occurred 
on the frontier or due to the exposure to foreign diseases. Therefore, these images, despite emerging from these periods, do not depict any of these traumatic episodes and or allude to the extreme nature of violence that was perpetrated against the First Peoples of Australia. Regrettably, these images represent a biased colonial narrative that is based on lies and myth-making and was the major me mechanism for perpetuating these fabrications. For me personally, I was and continue to be ever conscious that these Aboriginal men, women and children are the earliest European representations of my people. And yet we know so little of who they were, what Indigenous nations they belonged to or what their story was. They are lost within a colonial narrative of settler iconography in which they were misrepresented by non-Indigenous peoples whose agenda for depicting them in this fashion was problematic and questionable. When I look at these images, I feel the subject's trauma and sadness and lament the missed opportunity to understand or respectfully depict the first peoples of the Australian continent. While, of course, we cannot right the wrongs of the past or undo the wrongs of the past, we can acknowledge the truth in all its complexity and work towards understanding our shared Australian history with respect, patience and humility. It is when we do this collectively that we can truly work towards reconciling our nation, Australia. Thank you. Obrigado às pessoas que enviaram perguntas. A gente vai dar início, então, à nossa conversa aqui. Como vocês veem as diferenças entre comunidades indígenas no Brasil e nos Estados Unidos no plano da produção, circulação e institucionalização da arte? Porque, certamente, não é possível colocar no mesmo plano a situação de artistas indígenas no Brasil e em países ricos e desenvolvidos como os Estados Unidos e a Austrália, do ponto de vista das condições materiais de produção dos povos indígenas e a consequente circulação desses trabalhos e essas imagens no sistema institucional. Thank you for the question. I think from the external environment and thinking of the difference of the indigenous people's experience in Brazil and the indigenous people's experience in the United States These are temporally different spaces, but I think that the colonialist project, as it has gone through the global experience, is very common, actually. And for our American Indian communities, the capacity to um, have scholars, particularly indigenous scholars, considering their works as art and not simply ethnography, which Diara ex um, expressed, which I think is incredibly important to consider. These are really very recent evolutions in our discourse. Even when I was, um, I posed the question, where are the people thinking of our arts from an indigenous perspective? That was only in 1993. And I would say that the scholarship has really only grown um, in the last decade. And I don't know if I'm, I could be mistaken about that, but I'm looking out to my colleagues and there's some nodding heads. It is my belief that part of what shifted for indigenous American communities, which even as I grew up in my community in Oklahoma, our employment challenges were such that people could not make a living wage um, even when they had a position and that we lived with dirt roads and in homes that were incredibly ill-equipped for our harsh Oklahoma weather uh, winters. We have terrible tornadoes and um, very harsh wind. We, we can, um, We're in the middle of the continent, and we can have wind that is, um, I don't know how to translate this, but 70 miles an hour. Um, 
It's hurricane force winds on a day without being a severe weather day. So we have, um, we can have naturally very dramatic, um, challenging living circumstance to survive. But in 1992, which was on the 500th anniversary of the landing of Columbus in the US, there were celebrations. And at that moment is a critical juncture for our indigenous communities because we basically had survived and we're no longer going to stand off to the side and continue to be oppressed. The political and economic circumstances for our tribal communities changed when we were able to take over um, the politics of that. And I think that when I have seen and read very, and I'm sorry, forgive me, because I know that there is so much more to learn about the indig indigenous arts in Brazil and the indigenous communities. But what I see, I recognize. And it is some things our communities have had to deal with. And so I think that, um, it is not difficult to compare. And I think the challenge for us has been for our indigenous peoples to suffer through the challenges of PhD programs, which are not friendly to indigenous people or thought, and for us to take leadership in institutions to create space for those others to follow behind us and to broaden that discourse. Thank you. Uh I, I guess for um, myself, as I see the Aboriginal art industry in Australia, and it, it is an industry now, um, there are many aspects to it that I think are important to consider when we consider, when we uh, think about the history of colonization across the planet. Um, of course, the indigenous people in Australia, we, our sovereignty was never recognized. So we never had a treaty. Um, uh, we were moved from our land. Um, we were dispossessed and as I've mentioned, our numbers reduced extremely in that first period of invasion. But what sustained the communities is their culture. And the first thing the colonizer wanted to get rid of was the culture and the language and the ceremony. And so through uh, various mechanisms, some of our elders like William Barrick and Tommy McRae continued to maintain a strong focus despite what was coming against them and they, they drew upon others. In fact, in Australia, it wasn't until 1967, so some uh, three years, four years after I was born, that I then began to be recognised under the Commonwealth Governor through a referendum that took place that recognised Indigenous peoples in Australia for the first time. So 1967, and then of course the political advocating began. Australia was very afraid. They were afraid that the communists were helping the Aboriginal people and there was much protest. But slowly through that process of determination, self-determination and advocacy, um, our artists came to the fore as they were in the past. And uh, our artists continue today to be the ones calling for change. Our artists are continually the ones placing their lives and their families and their communities at risk by bringing the rights of indigenous peoples to the fore in our own land. And I encourage the in indigenous peoples uh, that this is what we did in Australia. We, our art was seen as ethnographic and primitive right up until the 1980s. So it was categorized and collected only by museums. But 
the commercial art market became interested in the late 1970s and by the 1980s we had a secondary market of non-Indigenous people who were really invested. And that investment meant that our artists had it to be more clever and smarter and protective of each other. And we are still trying to do that by ensuring that there are more Indigenous curators, more Indigenous arts directors, uh, more Indigenous people running art centres and cooperatives to ensure that our artists are protective because the commercial art market does run the industry in Australia and they are not Indigenous. We do not have, despite Aboriginal art creating hundreds of millions of dollars for the Australian economy, we do not have any multi-million dollar artists. We don't have any communities that are living in economic situations that we can truly celebrate. Our young people are dying because of suicide, health, bad health, unemployment, and yet our art and our artists who continue the fight bring our culture to the fore nationally and globally. In fact, if we were considered, consi think about our uh, Aboriginal art in Australia, there was more interest in Aboriginal art internationally before there was interest in Aboriginal art within Australia. And it was because of that international interest that non-Indigenous people in Australia started to take notice. And again, they only took notice initially because of the economic gain. They realised that if they were to buy a painting that was done in 1977 by an Aboriginal artist from Papunya, they could sell that painting four years later for over a million dollars. They could buy it for $15 or 25 in 1971, 72. So I think the issue is complex because we are Indigenous people who have been colonised by a force that no, no, knows no end. But what we need to do as Indigenous people is, is to stay strong and support each other and find ways through art, culture and language to care for each other, protect what we know is important and valuable and then share it globally so that as a global community, we can look after and protect and share and guide and support each other. Could I have some rapidinho? I, I just wanted to say that I am really honored to be here with you and listen to, to you uh, as a Brazilian indigenous people. But here we say in Brazil, we are all relatives. And that's true. É, só fazer um comentário a respeito disso, porque às vezes a gente tem uma ideia muito louca, muito absurda, né? Que um país mais, como é que é? Desenvolvido, né? Vai ser melhor com seus povos indígenas, pelo amor de Deus, é justamente o contrário. Será que o pessoal não se toca? Desculpa, assim, a minha franqueza, né? Mas a gente está falando de uma história de colonização, racismo, apagamento, negação das identidades, né? e a história dos povos indígenas ela é, sim, muito semelhante nas piores coisas que aconteceram com nossos povos ao redor do mundo, em todos os continentes, inclusive na Europa, né? que foi o primeiro lugar a se colonizar a si mesma, justamente através dessa história né? do imperialismo, do capitalismo, que, inclusive, continua nos assaltando no campo das artes, né? que, as, que as nossas colegas estão falando. Então, fica ali só uma reflexão mesmo, né? para que a gente possa... É, ter, assim, aproveitar ao máximo possível a oportunidade desse encontro para é, balançar esses estereótipos, esses paradigmas de sociedade que nós podemos ter. Gratidão. Thank you. Obrigado. Tem uma pergunta aqui que foi colocada para a Dayara e a Herder. Eu estou tentando reunir as perguntas numa mesma, que, numa mesma questão para todos ou para algumas, porque não vai dar tempo da gente responder todas as perguntas que foram enviadas. Desculpa. É, 
Recentemente, devido a guinadas xenofóbicas e de direita, é, especialmente nos Estados Unidos e no Brasil, né, representados pelas eleições recentes né, em ambos os países, estamos vendo uh, um, um, um enfrentamento, um declínio uh, nas relações com as comunidades indígenas e qualquer tipo de cultura autóctone. É, como, vo como vocês acham que poderia... É, quais as formas de resistência possíveis como as comunidades indígenas podem se colocar diante desse novo cenário político que talvez se agrave nos próximos anos? Formas de resistência, é a pergunta, então. Posso? <risos> é, é, mais uma vez, mais uma vez, né? porque a resistência indígena, eu acho que ela incomoda tanto justamente porque ela sempre foi constante, é mais forte, e, e, e ela incomoda cada vez mais esse sistema justamente por ser inabalável, inabalável. Então não, a gente não, eu não sei realmente até que ponto que a gente precisa de soluções ou de respostas, porque a gente continua resistindo, afirmando, ocupando nossos territórios de existência, né? Sejam eles as terras indígenas, nossas terras sagradas, nossas línguas, nossos conhecimentos, nossas práticas, nossa identidade. Isso é uma atitude, né? De, de autonomia, de liberdade. Né, é, que, que é essencial para qualquer ser humano. Né? E, e eu vejo que, hoje em dia, no mundo, é, apesar, apesar né, <risos> que realmente a gente está numa situação muito, muito foda, vou falar assim mesmo, a gente está numa situação terrível, a gente está numa situação insuportavelmente esdrúxula, de tão ridícula, né, de ter o carinha laranja de topetinho no cabelo segurando aquela marionete que se pendurou lá no Palácio do Planalto. Né? Com o perdão dos possíveis eleitores aqui presentes. Né? É, mas, assim, se incomodam tanto justamente porque, essa, no meu entendimento, é um tipo de pessoa que não consegue ter a visão o coração, a compreensão da relação com o humano, da relação com o mundo, da relação com a história, né? com a capacidade daquilo que nós podemos ser enquanto sociedade. E se hoje em dia, né, nesse momento crítico do nosso planeta, da sexta extinção em massa, do aquecimento global, de tantas guerras, os povos indígenas estamos na linha de frente de todas essas lutas, é porque nas terras indígenas nós temos 80% da biodiversidade do planeta, nós temos água limpa, nós temos alimento limpo, diverso, nós temos cultura e, principalmente, nós temos respeito em relação ao mundo, aos outros seres, né, as pessoas, e isso nós podemos compartilhar e continuamos compartilhando. Não sei se a gente precisa de mais alternativas, além de continuarmos sendo nós mesmos. Né? Quem precisa de mais alternativa, de repente, seja quem está faltando um pedacinho de orelha, né? ou, 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 de repente, um, um pedacinho de olho, ou um pedacinho de coração para se abrir a todas essas mensagens em tantas línguas maravilhosas, milhares de línguas indígenas. O problema não é a falta de tradução, né? é a falta de sentimento mesmo. Gratidão. I think that as um, I don't speak for all of my tribal community, I don't speak for all Native Americans in the United States, but from my own perspective, it is incumbent on our people as indigenous people to foremost preserve, practice our language, practice and live our philosophies to retain a relationship to the natural and spiritual and metaphysical environment within which we survive as indigenous people. There, there have always been these challenges. This is not the first time that indigenous people have been against um, such ridiculousness. But we have to survive as cultural people in order to be in the future. 
So we have to think of ourselves and the, the, we have to approach our cultures and use the wisdom of our ancestors, the wisdom of the prayers to connect to one another, to connect across these fictitious settler state boundaries. And we have to support one another as we move forward. I'm really honored to be here, to be sitting amongst um, this group of people, to be in the company of the other speakers. And when I go home, the work that I do is as much for the broader global indigenous community, but the motivation to do that work lies in a generation that I won't ever see, a generation forward, my daughter's grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And that motivation is the same motivation that my grandparents, my grandmothers, my great-grandmothers prayed for. And so as I actively live and go through a day, whatever the challenges that might be there, I pray for that future, I work for that future. And as long as we do not give up the idea that our present is owned or controlled by these fascist leaders, I believe that we will live into that future and that we have to carry ourselves forward into that future with everything that we've been given in order to survive this. The United States has been a nation just over 500 years. Well, just over 200 years, but we've had contact for 500 years. When I was speaking with some people about our ideas of history from an indigenous perspective, they wanted to start talking about our history from the beginning of the colonial times. And I just laughed at them because my history goes back to the point that our people were created on this earth, of this earth, and given the sacred languages that we have carried forward across time. I'm not dismissing the power that a single person or a party may have. But what I wanna say is that we have to be acting with the perseverance that not only will we survive these leaders, these political days, these political times and challenges, and they are challenges and we have to be forthright and strong but we have survived 500 years of this and we'll continue and survive after the United States falls apart. Francesca would like to say something. Oh, I, I would just like to um, add to this w wonderful um, wealth of uh, wisdom and knowledge um, by saying that we need to be strong. We need to be strong standing in our culture, standing strong on our country, and standing strong in our art. And through that process, you will find others will join. And we need to harness the energy of others in this process, because in Australia, we are only 3% of the population. And yet, the identity of our country is based on our art and our culture. But we are not a political force for change in our country because our numbers are small. So harnessing the energy, the commitment, and the support from non-Indigenous people to walk alongside us, not in front of us, not behind us, but walking alongside of us to ensure that our values, our agency, and our narratives lead the way. You know, the paper I gave to you here not long ago is a paper that I gave in a different form several months back. And a lot of non-Indigenous people don't know how to respond to what I'm saying. And 
I know when I take this paper back again to, into a different audience, again they will challenge. And that is what you have to do, is you have to be courageous, you need to be strong in your culture, in your knowledge, in your art, in your community, in your family. You acknowledge those who have gone before, you pay your respects to your ancestors and your family, you're mindful that, that your family is standing beside you, but equally you carry the responsibility that they handed to you. And then you have to carry it culturally to ensure that you do the right thing according to your ancestors, because it is a battle. It is a war and we are not respected in this space. So we must find as many mechanisms as possible and art and our artists are such remarkable people. And it is through that we can bring others. So I think it's about being strong, being open, listening, seeing, hearing, feeling and finding the strength in each other to then move forward together. Obrigado. Bom, o nosso tempo é, já se esgotou. Queria agradecer as palestrantes. Muito obrigado, parabéns. Obrigado pela presença de vocês. A gente retorna às 14 horas para a mesa da tarde. Obrigado.